It's a great honor. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, so we have two parts for this workshop. The first part is about forecasting large, how to forecast a large collection of time series. I will handle the first phase of the workshop. And the second phase of the workshop is about anomaly detection in large scale time series. And my sister uh, Priyanka will handle the second phase of the workshop. Um, uh, so uh, let me share my slides first. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the majority of the work that I present here today uh, was part of my PhD thesis. So I want to say a special thank you to my PhD supervisors, uh, Professor Rob Hyman and Professor George Athanosopoulos, as well as my contributors, uh, Pablo Montero Manzo, Funley and Yamfi Kang uh, for all of their wonderful contributions. Okay, uh, so uh, this is the this is the flow of my uh, uh, talk today. Uh, so I will first uh, start with uh, time series uh, features. Uh, we know forecasting is a very active research area, and forecasting plays a key role in business decision making process. And actually, many applications involve uh, the forecasting of large collection of time series. So this talk is all about how to forecast large collection of time series. Um, uh, for example, if you look at large scale, uh, large scale businesses, they want to forecast uh, demand for thousands of products across many warehouses. Uh, so if you look at this one, it's huge. Uh, so we're going to see um, uh, what what are, what are the ways of forecasting this large collection of uh, time series? When it comes to a large collection of time series, definitely we need some automated way of forecasting. So that's all about the central idea about, of my talk today. Uh, so before looking at uh, many large time series, uh, just uh, let's focus on a one single pr product. Uh, for example, in this case, um, I want to focus the demand for bananas. Uh, so here on my slide, you can see on the left hand side, I have the raw data from two, uh, June, to, uh, June 2012 to November 2020. And on my right hand side, you can see the visualization of the data, basically a time series plot. X axis represents the time and Y axis represents the demand, sales demand. So what I want to do is I want to know, I want to uh, forecast or the, uh, forecast the future values uh, beyond the period that I marked here. You can see up to pink line, I have data. And what I want to do is I want to get the predictions or the forecast for the next period. Uh, why I need forecast, particularly I want to answer these questions. How much will you see over the next 12 months? Or how much do we need to produce and when? So in order to answer these things, I need the forecast uh, for the future period. So when it comes to forecasting uh, a time series, uh, there are two approaches that we can use basically in, in, in this particular scenario. So one is you can obtain experts knowledge and based on the experts knowledge, you can give the forecast for the future periods. And the other method is uh, based on this historical data, we can create a model. Based on that model, we can generate the forecast for our required period. So when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to experts knowledge, it's uh, it's difficult to get expert knowledge always. Sometimes it's very costly as well. So one of the one of the cost effective method is to develop a model. So if I uh, look at the modeling process, 
I really like uh, I really like to put this schematic here uh, to show what might happen during what might happen during a typical modeling model building process. So when it comes to a time series, uh, you start with data wrangling process. Uh, basically data wrangling to identify the missing values of the data, to identify the unusual observations, or uh, to structure the data into a right format, to define frequencies. Those are the things that we have when it comes to data wrangling process. Next is, uh, when it comes to time series modeling, next what we're going to do is, before uh, doing the modeling, we need to visualize the data to understand uh, the patterns and to decide uh, which models to use. After that, uh, we also need to do some pre-processing, for example, split the time series into a training and test set, uh, or if we want, some, maybe we can impute missing values for the training part, uh, uh, outlier treatment for the training part. Those are considered as the data pre-processing. Next is to fill the models. So usually, we fit multiple models uh, 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 to the training part of the time series. And that's uh, denoted using the black color uh, lines. And then sometimes we, uh, and after that, we need to evaluate the forecast on, over the test set. After, after that, sometimes we need to tune the parameters in order to get the better forecast. Likewise, we need to iterate the process, do the process again and again for multiple models. Then finally, after that, what we are doing is we need to evaluate the models. We, evaluate, we need to evaluate all of the models in order to identify the best forecasting model for the time series. After that, again, we need to visualize the data to see uh, the uh, to see the to see the uh, similarities between our actuals and the forecasted values. And finally, what we need to do is we need to communicate our results uh, to our industry partners or our res uh, research collaborators. So if you look at a one single time series, you need to do this entire thing uh, for, the, for that series in order to uh, select the best forecasting model. But let's look at this one. Now, first of all, we look at a, just a one single product. But when it comes to a large scale businesses, we want to generate forecast for all of these products. Actually, they, so that means in this case, we get multiple time series. Not only that, we also need to forecast the demand for these multiple products across many uh, locations or many warehouses or many outlets. So you can see this application generate many millions of time series. So if we use this uh, process, if you use this process uh, to forecast the time series, when you have many millions of time series, it takes, uh, it takes a huge amount of time, as well as this is a computationally heavy process. So let's see uh, what we can do uh, when, we get, when we have a very large collection of time series. Uh, so let's start with the visualization process. Uh, so I will first visualize. First, uh, I will uh, I'll start with the visualization of the time series. Uh, so that's the first step that we have when it comes to forecasting. So here you can see I, I have one time series. Uh, next, I go for two time series. And here you can see I've got three time series, a 10 time series. You can see the situation is getting complicated. And here I got, I have 100 time series on the plot. So you can see it is, if it is hard to even visualize them. 
So another approach to visualize these time series is to use separate plots, separate uh, one panel for each time series. So then you will get multiple panels, but we know humans are not that patient enough to compare across that many panels. So you can see even the visualization is hard with the, uh, when, when it comes to a very large collection of time series. Uh, so what we are, so the main question that we have is how to forecast large number of univariate time series. So one approach that we can use is, so this is the previous plot. And now we, what I'm going to do is when in order to forecast these time series, what I can do is I can use just a single method to forecast across all of the time series. For example, let's say ARIMA models, then we are using ARIMA model uh, to forecast across all time series, or else let's say random walk, then we're going to use the random walk approach to forecast, generate forecast across all time series. But according to the no free lunch theorem, uh, we know that there is no single model that perform best on all kinds of time series. So we need, so POCA, so this is, approach is called aggregate selection rule, just a single method to forecast across all time series. But this approach, uh, it's not a suitable approach because we can't find a one single method that gives the best forecast across all time series. Then we go for the next approach that we can use to forecast large collection of time series. That's called individual model building. So that means we have to identify the best forecasting method for each and every time series. Uh, so this is the pro traditional approach that we use to identify the best forecasting method. Uh, the approach that I explained earlier, uh, so, but you know, when it comes to uh, even to uh, identify a, a suitable model for a single time series using this approach is uh, time consuming and computationally heavy because we need to fit multiple models, tune them and evaluate it, it, them across the test period and identify the best forecasting method. It's a very computationally heavy approach, but we somehow for this approach, if we in order to forecast a large collection of time series, we need a way to uh, identify, write a forecasting model for each and every time series. So here I'm going to explain a new method to identify best forecasting models for each and every time series. Okay, so this is the uh, a visualization of the problem that I have. One side you have a large collection of time series, and the other side I, uh, we have different forecasting me uh, methods. Uh, so I call this side as my problem space, which represents the large collection of time series. And this side I call it as algorithm space, which contains different forecasting models. The problem is to identify the right forecasting model for each and every time series. Okay. Uh, so here, in order to uh, answer this problem, uh, we use a method called feature-based time series forecasting. So before getting to features, I'll explain the things using a simple example. Here, I have six time series. And for these six time series, I apply my uh, traditional uh, forecast uh, model selection approach. I apply this method for each and every time series. And I identified for the first time series, the best forecast are given by the random walk model. Uh, for the second time series, the best forecasts are given by the naive approach. For the third one, again, the best forecasting method is random walk with drift. Fourth one, naive method, and fifth one, ETS modeling. And for the sixth one, the best forecasting method is a SARIMA approach. Uh, the question is, why random walk with a drift perform well on these time series, not with the others? 
why naive method perform well on the second and the fourth time series, not uh, not uh, not for others. Again, it is performed well on this. Why not? Uh, it is not performing well on this time series because they sort of have the set similar structure. But if you, here, if you look at this one, uh, the Sarima model works really well on this time series, but uh, for the other time series, uh, the Sarima is not the best approach. The reason for these differences is the features of the time series. For example, if you look at this last time series, you can see a trend pattern as well as a seasonal pattern. If you look at this time series, the fifth one in 1912, they can see a strong seasonal pattern, but there is no trend pattern in the series. If you look at the first time series, we can see there is a clear trend pattern, but there is no seasonality in the time series. These features, um, but the, these features, the differences in these features, um, it's the reason for them to select these different uh, methods as their best forecasting approach. So let's see what are time series features. Uh, so time series features, this was first introduced by John W. Tukey. Tukey called this as cognostic, computer-aided uh, diagnostic. Uh, some people call these as time series characteristics or we can call these as statistics computed on the time series. So what we are doing is we have, a uh, we have a time series. It's a collection of observations and we compute, we convert this time series into a vector of features like this. So now in my algorithm, I'm not going to work with this original raw data Instead, I transform my time series to a vector of features like this. So let's look at some, uh, uh, let's get some, uh, let's try to get, get the idea using our uh, visualization. So again, I have the same set of, uh, same uh, set time series, six time series. I computed two features uh, on top of these time series. One feature is strength of trend. The other one is strength of seasonality. And now, so you can see for the first time series, strength of trend is 0.995. And the seasonality, strength of seasonality is zero. And for the last time series, the strength of trend is 0.968 and the strength of seasonality is 0.927. So you can see the larger the value, that means uh, the, uh, we have that feature in the time series. If you look at the fifth time series, the strength of trend is really small, but the strength of seasonality is very high. Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, so th this is how these features are calculated. Uh, these are the um, uh, these are the feature measures uh, measurements that we use to compute uh, these features. Uh, the first one formula is to measure the strength of trend. And the second formula is to use this, uh, used to measure the strength of seasonality. And these measurements are calculated based on the STLD composition. So you can see here that we have the time series. Uh, using the STLD composition method, we uh, decompose the time series into two, three components, trend, uh, seasonality, and the remainder of the time series. And the strength of trend is measured using this formula, uh, maximum of these values. So this value is computed one minus the variance of the trend series, the remainder series, divided by the variance of the trend plus remainder series. So this measurement is introduced to compute the uh, uh, strength of trend. Furthermore, the, the strength of seasonality is computed, uh, one minus variance of the remainder series divided by variance of the seasonal components plus the remainder series. So these are just two measurements uh, that we have in our algorithm to capture the uh, features of the time series. So now earlier I got time domain represent, this is I call the time domain representation of the time series. Now I converted all of my raw data into a vector of features. 
I'm not going to work on the, my original data. Now, instead of original raw data, I have these features for each and every time CV. Now, when you now what you can do is you can represent all of these six time series on a single panel like this. And this is very easy to compare. If you look at uh, uh, the, these two time series, N625 and N0001, uh, their, uh, uh, str uh, their strength of str uh, trend is very uh, similar. And if you look at uh, this one in 2012, uh, if uh, when we look at our collections, this is a small collection, it's the time series that have that have the highest trend as well as the highest uh, seasonality. So you can see this uh, here, if you look at the feature domain representation, we just have one plotting panel and it, we have all of the time series on this plotting panel and it's very easy to compare rather than comparing across six panels. Okay, uh, so I explained you only two pieces, uh, two features. These are some other features that we can compute uh, on the time series. We can use length as a feature, strength of strength, strength of seasonality, lag one, not a correlation coefficient, uh, spectral entropy. Spectral entropy is used to measure the pro forecastability of the time series, uh, proportion of zeros. Uh, there is a measurement to compare the spikiness of the time series, curvature, linearity, stability, number of uh, param, uh, number of peaks. Um, uh, uh, furthermore, we use unit uh, test statistics of unit root test uh, as features. There are many other features that you can think of. You can fit a model to the time series. Any. Uh, 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 and uh, use the estimates of the parameters as features as well. So these are some of the features that we have introduced. If you look at, at the time series, there are made so many features that you, you can introduce. Okay, now what I'm going to use, I'm going to use these features to identify the best forecasting model for each and every time series. So with that, I'm coming to the real part of this workshop uh, for the phase one feature-based time series forecasting. So why don't we, let's look at the algorithm. So let's suppose this is the population of time series uh, that I uh, need to pop forecast. And what I'm going to do is from this population, I take a sample of observed time series. And I'm going to split each time series into two parts as training and test uh, series. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute features based on the training part of the time series. In addition to that, what I'm going to do is for each and every time series, I'm going to fit different forecasting models, and I'm going to compute forecasting accuracy over the test set. For all of the time series in my training set, I'm going to use the traditional approach uh, to fit the model. So I fit ARIMA model and compute the uh, forecasting error measure over the test set. And I recorded that error measurement here. Fit an ETS model, uh, for based on the training set, estimate the parameters based on the training set, and compute the uh, forecasting error measure over the test set. Fit a neural network model uh, using the training set and compute the forecast error measure over the test set. Likewise, I'm going to do this for all of my time series in the training set. So now I have two things computed based uh, on these time series. One is features. The other thing that I have is the forecast error measure computed from the time series. Based on these uh, forecasting error measures, what I can do is I can identify the best forecasting model for each and every time series. For example, let's say I fitted only ARIMA, ETS, and neural network for the first time series. Based on these three measures, you can see the forecasting error is very low for the ETS models. So for the uh, first time series, the best forecasting me model uh, method is ETS. So I'm going to label uh, the first forecasting uh, uh, first time series as ETS. 
Likewise, for the second time series, the best forecasting method is ARIMA approach. So I'm going to label this time as uh, time series as ARIMA. Likewise, if you look at this one here, for the third time series, if I use only these three, uh, the best forecasting approach is ETS. So I'm going to label this third time series as ETS. So you can see now one side, we have features computed from the time series. And the other side, we have the best forecasting method computed uh, on, uh, on each and every time series. So now these features, um, features, these features work as inputs to my algorithm and the labels, the labels represent the best forecasting method for each and every time series. Uh, they work as my Y variable or the response variable uh, of the time series. So X represents X vector, X, vector X, X metric represents the features and Y vector represent the best forecasting model. So now what I can do is now this is like a supervised learning algorithm. One side I have features, the other side I have the best forecasting method for each and every time series. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to train a meta learner, which we call, in order to identify the relationship between the features and the best forecasting method. So in order to train a meta learner, you can use any kind of uh, supervised learning algorithm. Uh, in our case, we use a, a random forest algorithm. Uh, you can use XGBoost or uh, any, uh, any other uh, machine learning algorithm uh, to train, uh, uh, train the uh, meta learner, which we call, we call that a trained uh, model as the meta learner. So this completes the offline phase of our algorithm. So when you have new time series, what we are going to do is we are going to take compute the features from the time series and pass it to our meta learner and the meta learner will give us the best forecasting method. So for the new time series, we don't need to use a traditional approach to identify the best forecasting method. So if we use traditional approach, you need to fit all of these models to new time series and identify the best forecasting method, which is very computationally heavy and time cost, uh, but it takes lo lots of time. But when here in our algorithm, what we need to do is once we train a meta learner for the new time series, when we get a new time series, we just need to calculate the features and pass it to the meta learner, it will give us the best forecasting method. Okay, uh, so that's the overview of our algorithm. So the blue color section represents uh, the offline phase of our algorithm. Uh, the red color section represents the online phase of the algorithm. You just need to train the meta learner just only once. You don't need to redo it again and again. You just need to do this only uh, at once. Of course, the offline fa phase is a little bit computationally heavy, but we have some gain because when it comes to future time series, we don't need to uh, worry about fitting lots of models for a particular time series because we now have someone to tell us the best forecasting model for, e uh, for the time series. Okay, uh, so um, I have uh, implemented this algorithm. This algorithm is called actually FORMS, Feature-Based Forecast Model Selection. Um, I, uh, uh, I uh, implemented this algorithm in a package called SEER. Uh, so if you go to my GitHub page, you can download it through my GitHub page. Uh, this is an R package, um, or this is available on CRAN as well. So you can uh, use either CRAN or GitHub uh, to install the package. Um, actually here, you can see a picture of myself. Uh, I took this when I, uh, when I attended, uh, when I attend the uh, um, uh, uh, in, uh, international symposium on forecasting in 2019, 
uh, which was held in Greece. So um, I saw this bowl at Acropolis Mu Museum in Athens, uh, which which they call the uh, which they call this as uh, which they label this as seal. Uh, so um, it is considered as a fortune uh, fortune teller object. Uh, so that's the reason uh, for me to use the name uh, Seer for my package. Stuff it has a hidden meaning, the magic ball or the fortune teller. Okay, so with that, I'm going to explain how you should use my package Seer uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, generate forecasts from this forms algorithm. Uh, so, so to explain the uh, package, I'm going to use uh, a time series collection in the M in M, M competitions. Uh, so if you look, you use this MCOM package, you can uh, you can load uh, this time series. So this uh, yearly M yearly underscore M one. This contains 181 yearly time series, uh, and uh, the early time series comes from different domains. Uh, and for the test set, uh, again, I'm going to use M, the uh, data set called M3, which is also inside the package MCOMP uh, as my test series, uh, test set. In other words, this is my, uh, this, uh, I'm going to develop my meta learner based on M1 time series, and I'm going to evaluate my model over M3 time series. Uh, so this is a test set. It's like my new collection of time series and training set. It's like my observed time series. Okay, so first thing is tell features. So I got uh, in my original collection 181 time series. Uh, so using the cal features function, you can compute the features of the time series. Here I computed one uh, of 25 features for my yearly time series. And you can see the uh, values for the first 10 time series. So if you look at a single row, the row represents a single time series. We, now I don't have the row data. Instead, I, I represent the time series using 25 features. Uh, then now after that, what I want to do is, uh, so that the, these features becomes my X metrics to my algorithm. Uh, next, what I want to do is now I want to identify the best forecasting model for each and every time series. Uh, in this case, I use um, I I use Arima ETS random walk random walk with drift theta method neural net new network methods. Out of these arc, uh, out of these six methods, I want to identify the best forecasting method for each and every time series. So for my observed time series, what I did was I fit uh, all of these models for each and every time series and computed the forecast accuracy measure over the test set. Uh, uh, in this case, I used mean absolute scaled error. Uh, so this is H is the uh, test, uh, test period length is uh, six uh, and you will get uh, the forecast accuracy measures here. So for the first time series, ARIMA model, uh, the MAC value is a 10.52. This is the MAC for the ETS model. If you look at this one, so the minimum is given by uh, the ETS model. So the best forecasting method for the first time series is ETS. If you look at the second one, the best forecasting method for the second time series is a uh, random walk with the drift because it has the lowest I mean absolute scaled error. Uh, so um, if you uh, so in my package, uh, so what I did first I did first I computed the features and then I computed the forecast accuracy measure. Actually, this function will automatically uh, identify the best forecasting method for the time series as well. And then I want to prepare a training set. So in order to prepare the training set, I first uh, here I need to fast the accuracy set. Uh, it is this one, the accuracy measures that I computed across all time series. And in addition to that, I also need to pass the corresponding feature set. 
so the feature set is here, the features that I computed uh, across all of the time series. Uh, when I pass that one, it will automatically create a training set, which we have X features in the first few columns, and the last column represents the best forecasting method. Uh, so here you can see it has automatically identified the best forecasting method for the first time series is ETS. Uh, uh, for the second time series, random walk with thrift. This is the best forecasting method for the third model likewise. So now this is my um, Y variable and X variable is, is uh, X variables are my features. Uh, then what I need, so if you look at this one, this is now my training set. Uh, so I have a, um, uh, I have the features. If you look at the previous column, here I got 25 features. Uh, now in my training set, I have 26 variable. Uh, in addition to the features, I have another column that responds to the best forecasting method. Okay, uh, so next, what I did was I also using the same function using cal features function, I computed the features for my new time series as well. Uh, for these new time series, I'm not going to compute the accuracy measures. I'm going to compute identify the best forecasting method for these uh, ones using my algorithm using my meta learner. Okay, uh, then after that, what I did was uh, then you can use build underscore RF function to build a random forest model in order to map the relationship between the features and the best forecasting method. Uh, so here, first I need to pass the training set. Uh, there are different versions of the algorithms. If you have a class uh, imbalance problem, um, we have one, uh, one version of the ran random uh, forest algorithm. If you want to ignore the uh, class, imbalance, uh, problem, class imbalance problem, we have one version of the random forest. Uh, you can define the random forest type here. I have given all of the descriptions in the help pages, uh, in the help page of the package. Uh, number of trees, uh, the number of trees that you want to build. Uh, you can set the seed um, if you want to reproduce, if you want to make your results reproducible, uh, and you can also pass the other parameters. So now what I did was, so here it builds the random forest uh, uh, to map the relationship between the features and best forecasting model. Then my goal is to identify the best forecasting method for the new time series. So I extract the random forest uh, uh, from my previous code and M3 yearly features, features that I computed, uh, uh, the feature set that I computed for my new time series. I have here uh, uh, for, for the new time series, I pass it here. Now you can see my algorithm automatically uh, suggests the best forecasting method for each and every time series. So for the first time series in my new collection, the best forecasting method is ETS model with strength component. For the second time series, the best forecasting method is random walk with drift. Third one, the best forecasting method is random walk with drift. Fourth one, best forecasting method is random walk with drift. Likewise, you can identify the best forecasting method for each and every time series. Uh, so this is very computationally efficient because you don't need to fit multiple time series. You just need to calculate the features of the time series. And after that, uh, we have a function called RF forecast. You can use RF forecast to generate the forecast based on those identified time series. Uh, so you can hear, um, uh, uh, you have to pass the predicted label and the time series. Uh, so you can see for the first time series, uh, for the uh, future, P, uh, uh, future forecast for the six uh, periods, uh, for the next six periods, we have it here. And for the second time series, for the next, uh, for the, next six period, the forecasts are here. Here, I explain this only for the two time series, but you can do this for many millions of time series. Uh, not only the forecast, you can obtain the prediction intervals as well. Uh, so this is the point forecast, and we can also obtain the lower confident band, as well as the upper confident band corresponds to the 
yeah, forecast. Mm. Okay. Uh, so actually, we tested our algorithm across uh, uh, across uh, uh, across uh, uh, across benchmark approaches. Uh, so you can see that this is the result. Uh, uh, that again, some other commonly used uh, benchmark approaches uh, for uh, forecasting. Um, okay. Uh, so next, let's look at another example that you can apply this scenario or this algorithm uh, to make forecast. Uh, for example, uh, here we have uh, the, 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 this uh, uh, John Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center provides, um, provides data related to uh, co co coronavirus uh, confirmed death uh, hospitalized cases. Um, you can download, so what I want to do is, uh, I want to visualize the confirmed cases across all of the countries. So here, uh, I extracted uh, uh, this data using coronavirus package uh, uh, re, uh, developed by Rami Crispin. Um, uh, and here you can see a snapshot of the uh, data set. Uh, so I have the data, province, country, latitude, longitude, and type cases and some other information related to those locations. And next, what I did first, uh, so if we, I visualize the time series, all of the time series using just the time series plots, uh, you see it like this. You can't see, uh, uh, you, can, you can't see the local behavior of the many individual time series. So here you can see US, India, some a significant uh, cases you can notice. But if I enlarge a small portion here, uh, uh, you can see there are lots of time series. You can't see any patterns here. So what problems do you see in this plot? So due to scale differences, we can't uh, see the patterns in the other time series. Uh, and also we have uh, the problem of overlapping here. So instead, uh, what I can do is, I can, I can compute uh, features from the time series, fe uh, features, from the, uh, features from these time series. In order to compute the features from the time series, actually there are two packages. One package is TS features, the other package is feast. Uh, you, can, uh, you can download, uh, you can install this feast package or TS features package. Uh, from CRAN or else you can use the GitHub version of, uh, of the package. Um, actually, this, this package was uh, developed by my uh, PhD supervisor, one of my PhD supervisors, Professor Rob Hyman and his team. Uh, now I'm going to use this package in order to compute the features of the time series. So you can see originally for each and every country, I have the raw values, I have the confirmed cases like this. Now, if when I convert this into feature-based representation, instead of raw values for each and every country, now I have 25 features computed based on their time series. First one is Af Afghanistan here. You can see I have 25 features corresponds to Afghanistan. And then, so here I have given the code uh, to compute the features. First one is just to do some time series process uh, pre-processing. Uh, I just uh, extracted uh, confirmed cases uh, from uh, confirmed cases um, uh, from the reports, uh, from the coronavirus uh, package because it contains not only the confirmed cases, some other information as well, death cases, hospitalized cases as well. Uh, then I created uh, uh, one series for each and every country uh, in that package for some series uh, for some uh, for some uh, see, uh, some series are not aggregated count they are disaggregated counts like province wise data state wise data instead I aggregated all of these those values and I uh, based on this one for I have now a one single time series for every country. Then what I did first, uh, I used Tissible package again from my supervisor's team. Um, and I, 
index is my date column, key column is country. And then I use this one uh, and I use features function in the feast package uh, to compute the features. Um, actually, if you look at the features, there are different kinds of features, decomposition features, uh, features computed based on the autocorrelation plots, uh, features computed based on the unit truth test, uh, features uh, decomposition means features computed based on the SDL decomposition approach. Um, so you can select subclasses as well. Uh, so the, actually this code generates all the, uh, this, uh, uh, this data frame. So after that, instead of visualizing the time series like this, what I can do is now I can do the feature-based visualization. If I have, uh, when I have two features like strength of trend and strength of seasonality, it's easy to visualize them using our 2D scatter plot like this. Uh, but when you have uh, multiple features like this, in order to visualize these time series, actually you can use some dimension reduction technique, uh, such as principal component analysis, in order to reduce the dimension. Uh, and after that, uh, based on these reduced dimension, you can visualize the series instead of, uh, you can, for example, you can X axis is for first PC, second axis is for the second PC. Then instead of a time domain representation, you can get a feature domain uh, representation of the time series. Um, so, so far, all of the packages that I introduce, uh, they are all R packages. Uh, TS features, uh, 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 there's a package called TS features, again from uh, uh, my supervisor's team, um, also one of the co-authors of the package. And at this group of researchers, they have uh, developed the Python version of our TS features package. So the good news is now you have, if you are an R user, you can use the TS features package in R. If you're a Python user, you can use our, uh, the Python version of the TS features package. Um, uh, but the format that you need to uh, use in this is a little bit different. Uh, if you want, for example, let's say you have a Y time series uh, and here in order to uh, use the TS uh, features package uh, in the Python, in order to compute the uh, forecast for the time series, what you need to do is first you have to arrange the data set like this. Uh, you should have a, a time column and the Y column represents the observed Y variable values and the unique ID. If you have one time series, the unique ID is identical. And after that, what you need to do is you have to pass this one, oh, sorry. Uh, you have to pass uh, the pass this df uh, into the ts features function and it will compute the features uh, for example here is another example here i've i loaded the famous airline data set that we use in time series and i can't use this format uh, uh, in order to compute the features first of all i need to convert this format into a format like this uh, ds should be my uh, time variable, y is my response variable, y variable, and unique id is one because I have just a one time series. And then what I need to do is when I pass this one to ts features, DF, uh, TS features then it will compute the features corresponds to the time series. Uh, if you have a multiple time series, you should have a unique id like this. So here in this case, I have two time series. One time series is A, the other time series is B. Uh, the values correspond to the first time series, they are represented by A. The values correspond to the second time series, they, uh, the unique ID for that is B. Uh, then what you need to do is, you have to pass this one, when you pass this DF3 data frame into TS features function, it will compute the features uh, corresponds to all of the uh, all of the time series in your data frame. So that's the format that you need to use uh, if you're a, if you are a Python user. Okay. Uh, so what did we learn and where to go from here? 
So what I discussed is I use X features and Y are based on these accuracy measures. I computed the best forecasting method for each and every time series. So in my algorithm, forms algorithm, X is, X is a matrix, Y is a vector. Instead of developing um, uh, in that in the forms algorithm, I develop a model meta learner to identify the relationship between the feature matrix and the Y variables. And the Y variable, which represents the best forecasting method. Actually, instead of doing that, you can actually develop a supervised learning algorithm uh, to identify the relationship between this X matrix and Y matrix rather than using their best forecasting method, you can use this uh, Y matrix as it is and train an algorithm to identify the relationship between X and Y. Uh, then you train a model uh, in which when you pass a new vector, it should predict the uh, error measure for all of these, uh, all of these uh, uh, methods. Uh, so actually, we also develop uh, another new, another algorithm by using this concept that's called Form PP, Feature-Based Forecast Model Performance Prediction. Uh, the paper, if you go to my website, you can you can see the paper. The paper is uh, published in the International Journal of Forecasting. Um, and also uh, with uh, my supervisors and Pablo Montero Mensu, uh, we also developed another uh, algorithm called FORMA, uh, which, uh, which ranked second place in the M4 competition, in which we used a developer meta learner to identify the weights for forecast combination. There also we use the uh, forecast error measures as, as a Y variable and we train the model in a way uh, that it gives weights uh, for each and every mo model. Then we use those weights to generate the forecast combination. Uh, so those are the, 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 so that's the main idea uh, that I wanted to pass uh, through this workshop. Uh, in addition to that, you can do uh, several, many other things on the top of this developed algorithm. Uh, so machine learning interpretability methods, it's an active area. Uh, so you can apply machine learning interpretability methods uh, on this meta learner algorithm to see uh, how, which, uh, which features are most important? Uh, where are they important? How are they important? When and how features are linked with the prediction outcome? And when and how strongly these features interact with the, uh, with the others? For example, in our, uh, and when selecting the best forecasting model as random walk, which feature is most influential for that decision? Uh, we also have a paper uh, explaining these things. Uh, this is uh, it's currently under review. Uh, uh, so these are some of the things that we uh, did in that paper. Uh, for example, when it comes to random forest, we use bootstrap uh, samples in order to make the decision trees. For example, suppose these are the observations that the first uh, uh, observation appeared in the bo first bootstrap sample. And these are the out, these are called the out of bag observations. And based on these out of bag observations, uh, they gave us a what matrix like this. So first, uh, this is, uh, for example, if you look at the second observation, second observation is used uh, in developing these uh, the decision trees, the decision trees that I highlighted in orange, and it is passed across the other trees and develop uh, uh, and identify the votes. For example, five trees suggest uh, the uh, best forecasting method for the second series is far, uh, 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 white noise. And the two uh, uh, suggest the best forecasting method for the second one is neural network method. Uh, so based on this one, you will get a vote matrix like this. And visualizing the vote matrix, you can identify the series that are easy to forecast and for the series that are difficult to forecast. 
For example, if you get a time series like this, the all of the trees such as for the first for, for series, the best forecasting method is random walk. So that's an easy time series to forecast. But if you look at these, the, the last one, um, the random for some, uh, some trees such as random walk, some trees such as random walk with tree. So that's such, such as an, a hard, uh, that series is hard to forecast. So based on this, not only forecasting, you can get some uh, information, some important information related to other series. Uh, so in addition to that, you can, as I mentioned, you can use all of the machine learning interpretability methods on top of the meta learner in order to identify the best forecasting methods. Uh, so these are all of the, uh, so these are the last couple of slides just ex, uh, gives some, um, uh, just uh, 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 shows you some methods that we applied on the time series. We applied both the global uh, machine learning interpretability methods as well as the local machine learning interpretability methods. Uh, okay, so with that, um, uh, with that, I come to the end of my talk. So uh, my, if you want to get the slides, slides, I will link my, the slides uh, to, the, to my website. And I'm on Twitter under the head, and I'm on Twitter and GitHub under handle Tiang T. And if you want, uh, if you want, if you have any questions, you can um, write to me uh, or uh, write to me uh, under ttalagala at sjp.ac. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, um, I think uh, then we can uh, we can see other. Uh, I think we can move to the second session, and th then after that we can take the questions. Yeah, okay. if you have any questions, you can put it into the chat box. I can uh, I can go through them while uh, Priyanka is uh, doing her talk. Okay, I hope you all can see my screen. Uh, okay, good. Okay, so um, so good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. So during Tianga's session, so this is the uh, topic of this workshop, forecasting, uh, forecasting and anomaly detection in large scale time series. Now, during Tianga's session, she mainly focused on this first part, forecasting large scale time series. And during this second session, I'm going to focus uh, the second part of this topic, anomaly detection in large scale time series. So all the slides are available in my uh, website. If you go to my website, prethal.netlify.app, you will be able to find out the slides of this talk. Okay, so, um, so these are my collaborators. Uh, the things that I'm going to um, discuss today are based uh, on uh, multiple collaborative research um, carried out with my with some of my collaborators. So some of the things that I'm going to present today um, based on my PhD thesis. So these are my PhD supervisors, Professor Rob Heinemann and Professor Kate Smith Miles. This is me. Um, and some of the things that I'm going to present today are based on some research work that I carried out with my research students. These are some of my research students students. Okay, so um, okay, with that, I come to the main topic, anomaly detection. So before I come to the real part of this talk, because our focus is on anomaly detection in time series data, but um, before coming to that topic, um, let me start with this general term, anomaly detection. Now, this problem of anomaly detection has many different facets, and we can clearly see that um, if you go to this grand task view here, um, if you just click on this one, it will bring you to this page. So this is the CRAN, this is a CRAN task view for anomaly detection in R. Um, so I'm the main maintainer of this um, CRAN task view. So during this survey, 
we notice that there are more than 160 R packages for anomaly detection um, problems. So here I have categorized them according to their focus. We have R packages for univariate outlier detection, multivariate outlier detection, and again for these multivariate anomaly detection methods, they have diff they have used different different analytical techniques. Some of them are based on density based approaches. Some of them have used distance based approaches. So likewise, I have categorize them according to the technique that they have used in order to identify the anomalies in multivariate uh, data. And then in addition to that, we can also see there are some packages uh, focusing on the temporal data. And that is one of the main topics that we are going to focus during this session. And then we have uh, we also have some anomaly detection packages for spatial uh, outliers, and also we have few packages for spatial temporal data, and also we have few outlier detection packages for functional data. So likewise, now you can see this anomaly detection problem has many different facets. Now the question is, now why do we need this many number of uh, anomaly detection packages? The reason for that is when it comes to this anomaly detection problem, there's no unified definition for an anomaly. And it is heavily influenced by the way we, and it is heavily influenced the application that we have. And when it comes to anomaly detection algorithms, they are also heavily depend on the way you define an anomaly. And that's the reason for us to, for us to have so many different R packages, dedicated R packages for anomaly detection problems. Okay, so um, during my previous discussion, I mentioned that there are, there's no unified definition for an anomaly. However, when it comes to, uh, uh, however, when, according to past literature, um, even though there's no unified definition for an anomaly, um, there are some definitions that are general enough to cope with some anomaly detection problems in various application domains. So according to past literature, we can basically divide this anomaly detection problem into two different categories. One is anomaly detection algorithms for high dimensional data, and the other one is anomaly detection algorithm for temporal data. So if you come to this one, so here I have given it in a two-dimensional space, but when, when, it, when I say high dimensional data, it can contain more than two dimensions. Now, basically, when it comes to anomalies in high dimensional data, we can identify three different types of anomalies. Here, are global anomalies, local anomalies, and microclusters. Now, when it comes to global anomaly, here we call it as a global anomaly if that data point is far away from the entire data set. Here we can see there's a significant gap between this data point and this one. In such situation, we call it as a global anomaly. And there was, there's another category type of anomaly called local anomaly. Now these anomalies, now they are anomalies with respect to the neighboring points. That's why we call them as local anomalies. They are somewhat far away from the neighboring points. This one with respect to the entire data. And in addition to that, there's another type of anomaly called microclusters. Now these anomalies, this is basically an anomalous cluster, a, a, a cluster, a small cluster of points that are far away from the majority of the entire data set. Again, we call them as anomalous clusters or um, in the, in sometimes you will find it as micro clusters. Okay, so these are some possible anomalous anomaly types that you will see in a high dimensional data set. And there we assume that the observations are independent. Now, when it comes to temporal data, Again, you can see three different, you can identify three different types, you, uh, types of anomaly detection problems. So now according, now here, these are the three different types of anomaly detection problems that you can identify under temporal data, under time series data domain. So the first one is contextual anomalies within a given time series. So as you can see clearly, here are the contextual anomalies, sometimes we call them as point anomalies. Here, we try to identify some observations that are far away, that are de significantly deviating from the rest of the time series. 
And uh, so now this is a point anomaly within a given time series. You take one time series and you find out, we try to find some observations that are far away from the general pattern. The second type of anomaly is collective anomalies. Now here, now the, uh, here our, in this case, here anomalous subsequence within a given time series. Now, in this case, our focus is not on the individual observations, but an but a subsequence says, that are deviating from the general pattern. So here you can clearly see now the, here we have individual observations. Now here we are focusing on anomalous subsequences. Now in these two cases, here we can see we talk about anomalies within a given time series. Here, this is a within given time series. This is a within given time series. Then we come to the third type of anomaly, anomaly detection problem that you will come across under temporal data. It's this. So now this one is a little bit different to the first two contexts. The problem is anomalous series within a space of collection of series. Now, when it comes to the third part, our focus is not on the individual observed. Our focus is not on a given time series, but a collection of time series. Basically, what happens is you have a collection of time series, and within that, within this time series collection, you try to find some anomalous time series within this collection. So we are trying to find a um, here we focus on the observations within a time series. Here we focus on what uh, an, an entire time series. And this is the main topic that I'm going to discuss uh, during, this, um, during this session because our focus is on anomaly detection in large scale time series. Okay, so now, uh, so we identify, now we know there are three types of anomalies in temporal data. And during our survey, when we try to, when we maintain this anomaly edit grant task we for anomaly detection packages, we notice that most of these existing anomaly detection are packages for temporal data dedicates to these two problems. They mainly focus on these two problems, contextual anomalies within the given time series and anomalous time series, sub anomalous subsequence within a given time series. And very limited attempt has been given to this problem, anomalous series within a space of collection of time series. And uh, this is, and that is the research gap that we wanted to address during these research work. So now, so during this talk, my focus is now on this problem, anomaly, identifying anomalous series within a collection of time series. Now the question is, uh, what's the purpose of now? What is the purpose of focusing on this one? Are there any applications related to this? Actually, here what you can see some applications related to this problem. Now there are so many applications that you can find um, in that problem domain. So here I have a few examples. Here what you can see is gas or oil pipeline de leakage detection. Uh, you can find similar problems if you try to find some sports defects in solar panels in solar farms or water quality sensors. So if I explain one thing, let's come to this example. Now imagine you want to identify the gas or oil pipeline leakages of this um, gas or oil pipeline leakage. Then what you can do is you can use a sensor cable. You can attach a sensor cable to this pipeline. Now, since you have attached a sensor cable to this gas pipeline, now each point of this sensor cable act as a sensor and generate a time series over time. So, and uh, now during a gas leakage, this escape pressurized gas can create a local hole zone at the surface of the pipeline. And that will be indicated by the corresponding time series. So we have a large collection of time series because I consider the entire cable. Each point of the cable gives me a large collection of time series. Now the anomalous time series within that collection um, indicate some unusual behaviors. 
And here again, you have sensors attached to each and every solar panel. And if you monitor these time series, and if you identify some anomalous time series within that collection, you will be identify, you will be able to identify some solar panels with some defects. And the same thing happened with water quality sensors positioned at different geographical locations. If you can see anomalous time series, that indicate an unusual behavior. Or fence-mounted perimeter intrusion detection systems, again, the same concept. You have a fence, you have a sensor cable attached along the fence. When a person try to come to this one, now um, each point of this sensor cable generate a time series. So whenever there's an intrusion activity, um, there, whenever there's an intruder, then that will be indicated by the corresponding time series. Now, likewise, that we can think about so many different applications. Now, here you can see all these applications generate millions or even billions of individual time series simultaneously. And the underlying research question is, what are the anomalous time series within a large collection of time series? And this is the problem that I'm going to address during this talk. So now, when it comes to this anomaly detection problem, we can think, we can there are two approaches to solve this problem, anomaly detection for temporal data. So one is, one problem, as one problem domain that you can think about is anomaly detection, anomaly anomalies within a large collection of time series. And now you get this large collection of time series as a batch data set. So here the idea is now when you get up in when you are in a batch scenario, you get a static data set and you get access to the whole data set prior to the analysis. And then during this one, your focus is to identify the complete events. Now, this black blob uh, basically represents an unusual behavior. You have 600 time series and this black blob represents some anomalous time series. And the second type is data stream scenario. Now here the idea is now the data, you don't have access to the entire data set prior to the analysis. Now here the data flows continuously at high speed and high volume. Now, as a result of that, now you need, a, you need when you are dealing with data stream scenario, you need to make real time decision. Now, because of that, you, what you where under this scenario, you have to work with incomplete data. But what you get access to is an incomplete data set. Here you get access to the entire data set to make your decision, but here you just get a part of that information, a part of the data set. And based on that one, you need to make the decision. So the, compared to the batch scenario, data stream scenario is very challenging. And this is something that we are going to address during this talk. And you can directly apply these concepts to the batch scenario as well. Okay. So, and so now I told you that our focus is on the anomaly detection in data streams. And this is something that we try to address through our stray package. This is search and trace anomaly. This package is on CRAN and you can also get access to the development version of this one through my GitHub account. Okay, so let me, and again, um, uh, recently, um, uh, Kate, so we have, this is an R package. Recently, this researcher Kate Butcher, which on has uh, ported a stray algorithm to Python and made it available in the Skatime package uh, library. So if you if you are a Python user, you can get access to this uh, package, the, prepare, the algorithm that we proposed through this Skatime package the Python implementation of the algorithm through this SK time package. Okay, so now let me walk you through the algorithm. So here, basically, uh, what, what we try to do is, now here we introduce this stray package focusing on the high dimensional data. But you can easily use this one for the temporal data. But since our initial focus was on high dimensional data, in order to give you the idea behind this package, let me use a high dimensional data set. And then I will explain how you can use this stray algorithm to identify um, anomalies in temporal domain. Okay, so here, 
through this package, through this algorithm, what we tried to do was we proposed a framework to detect anomalies in high dimensional data. And this proposed algorithm, our stray algorithm, addresses some of the limitations of HD outlier algorithm proposed by Wilkinson. So this is another R package, and we this is our stray algorithm is an extended version of that. Okay, so now during the initial phase of this discussion, I mentioned that uh, outlier detection algorithms are heavily influenced by the way we define an anomaly. So in any outlier detection algorithm, the definition of an anomaly is very important. So in this algorithm, in this proposed algorithm, we define an anomaly as an observation that deviates markedly from the majority with a large distance gap. This is the most important thing. Now, here in this particular um, al algorithm, we define an anomaly with respect to the distance between data points. Now, because of this definition, we have an assumption in this algorithm. Here, we assume that because of this de definition, we assume that there's a large distance between typical data and the anomalies in comparison to the distance among typical data. I'll explain this using an example. Okay, so now this uh, algorithm is developed for high dimensional data, so you can use it for any dimensions, but let me use a very simple picture so that you can understand the real idea behind this. But this is applicable for high dimensional data as well, more than two dimensions situation. Okay, so here the, this is the idea behind the proposed stray, our stray algorithm. So now uh, we have a data set like this. So basically this is a majority. This represents the majority. Here we assume that majority represents the typical behavior. And now you can see there's one point that is far away from, the, from this majority. Maybe I can call it as a global anomaly. And in this stray algorithm, what we use was this distance. Now, if you go and check the nearest neighbor distances of these algorithms, if you go and take the nearest neighbor distance of each of these points. Now, here, if you think about these typical behavior, since they have a very close neighbor, their nearest neighbor distances are very small. But when it comes to this point, here you can see this is an anomaly. And if you calculate the nearest neighbor distance, now you can see there's a large significant gap. And that's the information that we use in order to identify an anomaly. Um, that's, that's the information that we can use in order to identify this type of anomaly. And this is actually the basis behind the stray algorithm and also the HDR fly algorithm. But one, this is actually what, the HD outlier algorithm has used, but we notice one problem with this one. Now here you can see this is a global anomaly and you, when it comes to global anomaly, you don't have any nearest neighbors. But if you think about this micro cluster, here we have another small cluster, which is far away from the majority. So this actually represents an anomalous cluster, or we call it as a micro cluster. Now the problem is, if you try to uh, get, uh, now if you try to identify this as an, ideally we want to mark this as an anomalous cluster. But if you just use the nearest neighbor distance, now for each and every point, you calculate the nearest neighbor distance. And then that is the information that we are going to use in order to identify an anomaly. But the problem is now, in this, when it comes to an anomalous cluster, you have some nearest neighbors. And because of that, now once you calculate the nearest neighbor distance, you cannot see any difference with, you cannot see any difference between these points and these points with respect to the nearest neighbor. And that is one of the major drawbacks we noticed in HD outlier algorithm. And then this is what we try to address from our stray package. So we did a slight modification to this algorithm from to the HD outliers algorithm. Now there are what we suggested this. Now, instead of getting the nearest neighbor distance, we suggested to consider K nearest neighbor distances. So now this K is a user defined parameter. User can decide the number of K nearest neighbor distances that you are going to take. And then once you calculate K nearest neighbor distance, here you can see, and then you 
pick the nearest neighbor distance with the maximum gap, maximum value. So for example, for this one, the first nearest neighbor distance gives you the maximum gap. Here, when it comes to this observation, the fifth nearest neighbor distance gives you the maximum gap. Maybe you are, if you set your k to 10, then you for each and every point, you get 10 nearest neighbor distances. And from that, you identify the nearest neighbor distance with the maximum gap. And likewise, we do this for e, all, all these observations and we extract the k nearest neighbor distances with the maximum gap. And now with respect to that one, we can see we can clearly differentiate this, uh, this one as a global outlier and this one as a microcluster. So this is the basis behind this. And now the question is, okay, now we try to identify the anomalies with significantly large k nearest neighbor distances. Now the question is, how can you actually identify, how do you know, how, how can you find a cutoff to label it as an anomaly, a significantly large gap or just a, a gap that can be ignored easily? Now, this is what we try to address through our anomaly, anomalous threshold calculation. Now, here in this algorithm, we have a data-driven anomalous threshold. One limitation that we noticed with most of these existing anomaly detection algorithms is most of them use a um, manually defined anomalous threshold. But here in this algorithm, we in our string algorithm, we define an anomalous threshold, uh, we define a data-driven anomalous threshold. So for that, we use extreme value theory to calculate the data-driven anomalous threshold. So basically, this extreme value theory focuses on the extreme, the, the behavior of the extreme cases of a given data set. And here, what we did was this. So if you think about, let n be the size of the data set. Imagine you have n data points in your uh, original data set. And then what we did was, we saw the resulting n outlier scores. Now in this algorithm, these are the outlier scores. These are the values that we are going to consider as outlier scores. So basically the k nearest distance with the maximum gap. And then we saw the resulting outlier scores. And then after that, we divide that data set, that scores, sorted scores, into two halves. And then we consider the first half, that means uh, the, the k nearest neighbor distances with small gaps, as our typical data set. And then uh, consider the half of the outlier scores with the smallest values as typical. And then we search for any significant large gap in the upper tape. So basically what we use, the bottom-up searching algorithm proposed by Schuers. And now this allows us to, so whenever we come across with a significantly large gap, we keep on searching the second half of your algorithm one by one. And whenever we come across with a data point with significantly large gap, we stop the searching mechanism and then we labeled all the remaining outlier points as anomalous points. So this is how we um, uh, came up with a, a data-driven anomalous threshold. Um, and then, um, so basically, in order to so this uh, uh, this uh, bottom-up searching algorithm uh, proposed by Schuers is based on this spacing theorem. Basically, according to this uh, spacing theorem, first it takes the uh, original data. And then it consider these ordered statistics. First, it arrange them in ascending order. And then after that, it consider the distance between these ordered statistics. And according to um, the spacing theorem, if our original data set is in the maximum domain of attraction of Gumbel distribution, then this spacing, then these DIs, these gaps are asymptotically independent and exponentially distributed with mean proportional to it. And this is the theory that I used in order to define this data-driven anomalous threshold. Okay, so now once we identify that at data driven anomalous threshold, now we have a cutoff for the uh, signals for these uh, distance, uh, k nearest neighbor distances. And if our k nearest neighbor distances for typical data, if that cut or if of some, if points 
um, exceed that uh, data-driven anomalous threshold, we label them as outliers. So now, um, so this is how uh, we propose. So that is the main idea behind this tray algorithm. So, so the advantage of this proposed algorithm. So if I just summarize the advantages of this proposed algorithm. Now, um, uh, this one thing is uh, one advantage of this proposed algorithm is um, here we can detect clusters of outline points. This was not possible with the original HD outlier package. And then we can apply this to both uni, um, um, both uni and multidimensional data sets. And this can handle large data sets due to the use of k-nearest neighbor, approximate k-nearest neighbor searching mechanism that we have incorporated in our algorithm. And another thing is this algorithm is a supervised learning. This algorithm is an unsupervised learning algorithm. So that is another advantage because sometimes there are situations you cannot find a separate training set. So now this since this is an unsupervised learning algorithm, you can easily apply that to any data set. And another thing is this has the possibility to deal with multimodal typical classes. If you have two clusters um, that represent the majority, still it work because we only consider the nearest neighbor distances between the observations. Once we calculate the k-nearest neighbor distances, we ignore the information, the original data set. And then the outlier threshold has a probabilistic, valid probabilistic interpretation. So these are the advantages of our proposed tree algorithm. Okay, so now, um, now the question is, now so far I discussed how to identify an anomaly with, in a high dimensional data set. So, but our topic here is, our focus is on identifying anomalies in um, temporal data. So how can we extend this one to identify, how can we use this concept to identify anomalies in large scale time series data? So again, so this is where we use feature-based representation of time series. I think during uh, Tianga's sessions, she discussed this feature-based representation of time series, this concept in detail. So we basically use the same concept. We are here, we have our original time series. We, through this feature-based representation of time series to these time series features, what we try to do was we try to extract the dynamic properties of our time series. So for this current work, uh, these are the features that I used. Uh, and I selected these features, mainly focusing on the applications that we got from our um, industry partners. But if you want, you can also go and uh, take, uh, consider more time series, time series features available from uh, FIEST or TS features package. Okay, so the idea is this, how we can use this tray algorithm to identify large scale uh, anomalous time series within a large scale, scale of time series. So here what we do is we use a moving window to deal with streaming data. So basically now we have a streaming data. Now in order to deal with the data stream, I'm going to use a sliding window approach. That means I use a sliding window of fixed length. And when I can get one slide in one window, I consider it as a batch data set and apply this the idea. And we, I slide the window one step ahead every time I get a new data set. So that's how we deal with sliding uh, streaming data. And then when I think about one window, then I extract the time series features from this window, from that window. So this is the implementation, the time series feature extraction capabilities are available through odd stream package as well. But here I have some limited number of features that we do, that we design targeting our applications. Um, but if you, if you want, you can use other time series package or feature packages to extract features. So basically I have my original time multivariate collection of time series. So TS data now represent the collection of time series. So I have hundred time series here. And now this odd streams command, the odd stream package, um, this is also my package. So this, if you pass that uh, collection of time series to this extract TS file features, it will extract time series features. And now here, what you can see here 
Here, these are basically um, the high dimensional space. I have 14 dimensions, and now each point of this um, in this high dimensional space correspond to a single time series in this collection. I have 100 time series, and uh, here I have 100 points. So that's how you can interpret this. What you can see here is just a random projection of that high dimensional space. Okay, so once you extract the features, now each point represents a time series. Now you apply the stray algorithm to this high dimensional data set. So now the outliers, then you can identify the outliers. Here I have marked some outliers and display outliers allow you to mark those things. Now these outliers, each point represent one time series in my um, original collection. And now these three points that I have marked represent these three time series. So, and you go back and if here first you identify the outline point and then the corresponding time series, you mark it as an outline series within this collection. So that's how we can identify. So that's how we can use this tree algorithm to identify anomalous time series within a large collection of time series. Now this looks perfect. Now here, I just give you the two dimensional uh, representation of that high dimensional data set. Here I have taken the two dimensional space uh, so that I can, I, um, we, can, we can get a better understanding through the visual representations. So here, if I just summarize it, now I have a collection of time series. Here I have 600 time series. Now here, now this, then I extract features and I project that to the two-dimensional space. Now each point in this, um, in this two-dimensional space represent one time series in this collection. And now I, you can see I have two anomalous time series and these two points correspond to the anomalous time series. So once you get this one, you can apply stray. And now it seems you can see there's a large significant distance gap. If you think about the nearest neighbor distances, there's a large significant gap. So we can use that information to ID, mark them as and now this looks perfect. And this was our original proposal when we got the problem from our industry partner. This was our original proposal. But then once we get the real data set, we notice a problem with our, uh, with our initial plan. So one thing that we notice is, now when it comes to most of the data sets that we got from our industry partners, there was a problem. That's, we noticed that that's one feature. We noticed that the time series are interconnected, that there's some kind of relationship between these time series. Now this, now, this is one time series of that nature. Now here, this black blob, so here altogether, I have 600 time series of this length. And then this black blob represents an anomalous time series. And here, you, what you can see is the two-dimensional projection of this time series. First, you extract features. And here, what you see, the two-dimensional space of that high dimension, two-dimensional projection of that high dimensional space. Now what you can see is, we notice that once we project that, once we extract features and once we form the high dimensional space, now we cannot see any difference. Now, when we think about the nearest neighbor distances, we could not see this type of a significant deviation from uh, the majority. This basically represents the typical time series and this part represents the anomalous time series. Now you can see, okay, there's some kind of a boundary here, but the problem is these points are not deviating from the major. Remember, we define the anomaly in our stray algorithm with respect to distance. Now with respect to distance, we cannot see any difference. With respect to the nearest neighbor distances, I cannot see any difference between these points. Now, because of that one, if you just apply stray algorithm to this problem, you will not you will not be able to identify the anomalies. So but the reason, so let me explain the reason for you to observe this type of thing using a practical example. Now imagine, uh, let's go back to my very first example, um, uh, gas leakage, uh, oil or gas pipeline leakages. Now, in such situation, maybe you can think this as so. Let's say you have attached a sensor cable. Now, these each point represent a one point of that pipeline. Now, let's say our gas pipeline leakage happened at this point. But you know, when it comes to this gas pipeline leakages, this kept pressurized gas can create a local cold zone at the surface of that pipeline. 
And now that will be indicated, that will have an impact not only to this particular location, it will also have an impact to the neighboring points in a slowly de decaying manner. So as a result of that, now you will not see a significant deviation. So maybe these points correspond to the actual point where you have anomalies, and these points represent the neighboring points of, to that location. So now because of this problem, we could not use our original stray algorithm to tackle the problems that we got from our industry partners. So this is what we try to address through our second algorithm, uh, Oddstream algorithm. So this was specifically developed for data streams because we noticed that most of the real world data sets suffers from this problem. So we came up with another algorithm for called Oddstream outlier detection in data streams. Again, this is on CRAN, but you, uh, you can also get access to the development version through my GitHub account. Okay, so now let me walk you through this algorithm. So now my stray algorithm is an unsupervised algorithm, but this odd stream algorithm is a semi-supervised algorithm. That means now in order to uh, get access to the, now in order to get access to the, um, in order to, uh, in order to use this one, first we need a training set and also a test set. Okay. So now again, I use for this one also, I use a feature-based um, time series approach. So as I explained earlier, now this is a semi-supervised approach. So that means I, I need a training data set. And in this training data set, I assume that the training data set is free from outlying series. So we need to start with a training set that is free from outlying series. And basically, under this outstream algorithm, what we try to do is we try to build a model for the typical behavior of the system. And whenever uh, uh, we observe something that is deviating from this typical behavior, we call it as an anomaly. The reason for us to go for this semi supervised approach is now, when it comes to anomalous behaviors, now you can think this as a binary classification problem. You have typical data points, you have anomalous points. But the problem with these, these two classes is when it comes to the typical behavior, the, the, most of the time that is a very, you will not see very different, that, that is the, 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 um, the, the variability of these two uh, classes are very different. When it comes to uh, the uh, typical data set, um, the changes that you normally, uh, when it comes to a given system, you can see a particular typical data, typical behavior. But when it comes to the anomalous behaviors, it's the, the it's very it's a dynamic the dynamic class. Here, what I want to highlight the fact is now when it comes to typical behavior, you can see some common patterns. But when it comes to the anomalous behavior, you will not see some patterns in order to model that class because that's why we actually call it as anomalous behavior because that is something deviant, that is something different from the typical class. So this is the idea that we try to use when, when it comes to our stream package. What we, we decided, first build a model for the typical behavior, and then anything that deviates from that one, we are going to call it as an outlet. So because of that, now for the training set, since we are trying to come up with a model for the typical behavior, we need a training set that is free from anomalous time series. And then, then what we do is we extract the time series features from each and every time series. So altogether, I have 600 time series here. This is the time series ID. So here, what you can see is the high dimensional feature space. So I have 600 time series. So you can see 600 points here. Now, each point of this high dimensional space correspond to a single time series in my original collection. And then what we did, so this is my high dimensional space and the dimensions are altogether, I considered 14 features. So here in this, in my high dimensional space, I have 14 dimensions. And then once I extract this one time series features, the dimension is further reduced by applying principal component analysis. And here, then we took the first two principal components, mainly targeting the better visual representations so that you can easily understand the behavior of your data set. 
So using the first two principal components, we define a two-dimensional space. So again, I had 600 points. So again, I, I get 600 points. Now each point represents one time series in my original collection. And then once I get this two-dimensional space, then I try to, so this is my typical behavior because all these time series represent a typical day, typical behavior. Now I try to find a boundary for this typical behavior. So for this boundary, basically that is, we call this boundary as our anomalous threshold. Now we are using this now, uh, basically uh, using now, once I, once I get this two dimensional space, using extreme value theory, I try to find a boundary for the typical behavior. So this is the approach that we use. Again, it has a data-driven um, anomalous threshold. So what we did was, so once you get the two-dimensional space, I estimate the probability density function of this 2D species space. For the current version, I use the kernel density estimation. And then, I draw a large, now once I get that two dimension density, that two dimension uh, density function of that two dimensional space, then I draw a large number of extremes from the estimated probability density. And then after that, so I have extremes, I did it for large number of times, and then I apply this side transformation uh, defined by Clifton. Now this, um, this side transformation, what it does is that try transformation map the density values back into a space where you can apply, where you can fit a gumball distribution. So that was my target. I wanted to identify, apply extreme value theory. And now the anomal as anomalous course, what we have is a density based um, number. Previously, in our three algorithm, we used the distance. In this algorithm, we use the density-based approach. Because if you go back and check this one, you can see here the typical behavior still represent the uh, high-density region, and all the anomalies belongs to the low-density region. That was the so that's why we decided to go for a density-based approach um, for this odd-stream algorithm. And then after, so basically here, if I just summarize this whole thing, basically what we did was here we have a data-driven anomalous threshold. Now we use an extreme value theory-based anomalous threshold. So that anomalous threshold now define a boundary for my typical class. And then uh, what I do is now I have my typical behavior here. You can see the gray points represent the typical behavior. That's how I, that's what I use to build my model. And then I uh, slide my window one step ahead every time I get a new data set. And then I extract the features of this new window and project that to the same 2D PC space. And now the points that are within that boundary, I call it as typical points. The points that deviate from that boundary, I call it as outliers. And you can see our algorithm has the capability to identify that anomalous behavior. You can see this black blob represent an anomalous behavior. And we can clearly see that one. Uh, you can clearly see that our algorithm has the ability to identify that one. So this was the idea behind the stream algorithm. And another thing that I wanted to highlight is, so here we use the feature-based algorithm. So if you just extract the feature, so I have 600 time series. So I have collected 600 features. Here you can see the 600 time series. And now here, these are the features that I collected. Through this one, what I wanted to highlight is, now this part, this, this part here, represent this black, correspond to this black blob. And you can see all these features that we have collected, most of these features has the ability to identify the anomalous behavior of this black blob. And uh, so that's how we selected the features for this particular um, algorithm. I told you that we selected only 14 features, but you can think about many other features. But we selected these 14 features, mainly focusing on some of the um, real world data sets that we got from our industry partners. Okay, so that's basically how, what we used in order to identify the anomalous time series within a large collection of time series. And now, uh, so basically what we deal with the streaming data scenario. With that, I'm coming to another topic, anomaly detection with non-stationary 
Now, when you are dealing with data streams, this is one of the main problems that you will encounter. So in matching, statisticians call it as non-stationarity. If you, the matching learning uh, researchers, the matching, uh, the, the, the researchers from machine learning um, uh, domain, they call it as concept drift. So still we are referring to the same thing. The idea is this. Now, when it comes to, now we are dealing with the stream, data stream. Now, when it comes to a given system, the typical, sometimes the typical behavior can change over time. We call it as a presence of non-stationarity or presence of a concept drift. And in such situations, now we build, we have built a, a model for our typical behavior. If the typical behavior change over time, then we need to update our model according to the new typical behavior. If there's a typical, if there's a concept drift. For, according to machine learning literature, there are, you can think about four different types of concept drifts. So one is sudden uh, change. So here but you have one typical behavior, all of a sudden it moves to a new typical behavior or gradual, uh, gradual non-stationarity. Now it takes some time for you to come to the uh, new typical behavior. And here you have real recurring non-stationarity. You have one typical behavior, again, a typical behavior. And after some time it come back to the typical uh, uh, previous typical behavior. Now, again, you need to update your tip model according to this typical behavior. And now according to this one, you need to update your model three times. And then, so finally we have uh, the incremental non-stationarity. Now it takes some time. It slowly moved to the um, a new typical behavior, not like a sudden change. And when it comes to real world data, you can even think about, you can even come across with a mixture of these um, concepts as a con uh, as non stationary now, how can you identify, now, how can you identify an anomaly? Um, how can you update? Now, the problem is now we have built a model for a typical behavior. Now, how can we ID our, update our model according to this new typical behavior? Now, for that, one possible approach is, now you are using a sliding window. You can update your model, update your typical model every time you move to and every time you get a new observation. But that is a very time consuming approach. And you can see if now if you have a sliding window of this length, now if you are going to update it, now it's just a waste of time. You only need to see an update of your typical behavior by the time you come to this one. So now the question is, how can you identify this occurrence of concept drift? So this is also capable in our odd stream algorithm. So this is how we used to identify an occurrence of a concept drift. And we updated our typical behavior, a typical model, only if there is an occurrence of a concept drift. So this is how we used. I used the same feature, uh, feature space in order to identify this concept drift. Now here, now this is a one typical behavior, imagine. So likewise, you now keep on searching this one. You slide this window um, every time you get a new data set. Now imagine two windows like this. Now this is my original typical window and this is where this is the now my current typical behavior typical model uh, based on this time series this window. Now this is the corresponding 2D PC space. Now let's come to another let's take another time series another window and now if I project that one to the same 2D space now you can see there's no dif significant difference between my previous density curve, density and the new density and again even from this one we cannot see there's no di significant difference between the typical behavior in these collections. Now let's come to let's move this window one step ahead. Now what you can see is now you start to see a difference here. And if you project that window to this space, now you can see there's a clear difference between the uh, density curve of this one and the density curve of this window. Now this is the information that we used in order to identify an occurrence of a concept rate. So every time before moving this sliding window, what we did was we check, we try to see whether there is a significant difference between these two distributions. 
And here, this is the p-value. Now you can see once you come to this one, up to this point, there's no significant difference between the densities. And once you come to this one, you can see there's a significant difference. And now this time it takes for you to identify, confirm the occurrence of new typical behavior depends on the size of the window. And after you come to some point, you start to realize, okay, this is going to be a new typical behavior, so I should update my model. So here what happens is every time you find a typical behavior, um, if every time you find an occurrence of a concept drift, you update your, um, you update your uh, typical model. And once you start, come to a new normal, now after this point, now there's no uh, difference between your previous typical behavior and this one. So no point of updating it. You can directly move to the testing part. So that's how it works. And these are some examples. So uh, these things are available in our paper as well. So basically our algorithm was able to identify the new typical behavior and then we update the, once we confirm that there is an occurrence of a new typical behavior, we updated it. And after some time, it started to give you um, the, 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 the results with high accuracy. Okay, so now we discuss two algorithms. One is stray and one is short stream. Now, stray is a supervised, uh, unsupervised algorithm. Odd stream is a semi-supervised algorithm. Now here, the choice is this. Now you can make a choice between these two. Now it depends on the data set. Now, if you feel like you are the time series available in your large collection, time series available in your collection are independent, then you will most probably, you will see these anomalies like this. So then in such situation, you can directly go to stray because it's an unsupervised algorithm. But if you, once you plot your algorithm data, if you see this type of a slow deviation from the majority without having any significant distance gap, now instead of going moving to the stray, you can go to the odd stream package. You can use the algorithm available in odd stream package. And here we have two companion papers, both are published in the JCGS. So here this stream, the companion paper is there, anomaly detection in high dimensional data. And for stream, we have another package, anomaly detection in streaming non-station temporal data. So you can go and read. If you are interested in this work, you can refer to these things in order to identify, in order to understand the mathematical concepts. Okay, so, so far, I discuss anomalies, anomaly detection in time series data. Now, when you think about this time series data, we call a time series. If you observe something over, over time, then what you get is a time series. But according to this definition, it is not necessary as an observation, it is not necessary for you to get a number. As you can even get an image as an observation. So if you think about the, if you think of collect an image over time, if you observe something uh, through an image over time, then what you get is an image time series. So now I'm going to explain, we can even use this algorithm to identify the anomalies in image time series. So basically, as I explained earlier, a stack of images or videos, we call it as image time series. And this image time series is basically a set of images of the same scene ordered chronologically. So we, we have observed the same scene through an image over time, then we get an image time series. Now it can be, now this data set, new data set can be encoded as a data cube. So you have images over time. So for an image, you have two spatial dimensions and you observe that one over time. So you get one temporal dimension. Now here, uh, so the, the, the product, now this basically gives us 2D plus T. So this is for the image, this is for the time. They, this data carry rich spatial and temporal information that must be taken into account to understand some P phenomena with that, that is not possible to observe just by looking at a single observation. Here I have some examples. Now, satellite images are very common in land analysis. Now, satellite images time series can be considered as a special type of image time series. 
So the satellite image time series is a set of satellite images taken from the same scene at different time points. Now you can see in order to identify this deforestation, you, it's not enough to have one, uh, one image, you need to monitor it over time. And now again, here you can see a volcano eruption. Now again, you can see, now if you keep on monitoring the same scene over time, you will be able to identify this type of unusual behaviors. So now this is something that we addressed. So this was the problem that we addressed from another project. So for this, now we have as a time series, as observations, we have images. We use the same concept, the feature-based approach. So I have a collection of time series. I have observed them over time. And now the order of these images are important. Now, as the first step, what we did was we extracted features from the, uh, these different images. Now the features, they are not time series features. We defined a new set of features to identify the dynamic properties and encapsulated in each of these images. So we came up with 87 features. So we use 87 features to describe one image. So if you have T, images here you get a data set with the observations and then what we did was so then we di we deduced the dimension into two dimensional space and then we extract the first species and then what we did was now he, then we divide that data set into two parts the series into two parts called training set and test set and then this training set, we assume that our training set represent a typical behavior that it is the, uh, this represent images without having any outliers. And then what we did was we built a univariate time series model for that univariate time series. I took only the first PC. And then we consider the residual series. So we have our forecasted values, we have our original values, we got this residual series. And then for the residual series, we apply the extreme value theory approach, extreme value theory. And through that, we were able to identify a data-driven anomalous threshold. And then after that, we came to our online phase. We got the forecast values for our first PC. And then for through that, we got the forecast errors. And then using this threshold, we went for this binary classification. If our errors deviate, exceed this anomalous threshold, we call it as an outlier. Otherwise, we call it as a typical behavior. So here, and, the, and we actually did, uh, we actually used two approaches. One is traditional based machine learning based approach and the deep learning based approach. Here, uh, now, uh, when we just, when it comes to the deep learning approach, we basically replace the way that we extract the features, this feature extraction part and the modeling part. So instead of using these manually defined features, we replace that feature extraction, uh, feature extraction part using a CNN-based algorithm. Now we use some transfer learning methods because if you start to train from scratch, now it requires a lot of data and it is time consuming. So in order to improve the generalizability of our model, we decided to use some pre-trained classifiers. And then using, so these are some of the um, CNN uh, architectures that we used. And then we extract features using this. Now, you know, these things, CNN architectures, they are originally defined, developed as classification algorithms. Now, we wanted to use that CNN architectures to extract features. So what we did was we, we took this architecture and we removed the last dense layer and we took the output coming from the flattened layer. So from that flatten layer, what you get is a vector. So for each image, I would say we were able to get a vector of values. And that is basically represent a feature for a given image. And then in order to, uh, in order to simplify our approach, once we extract features, now you get a large number of features. In order to reduce the problem coming from the curse of dimensionality, what we did was we decided to get a univariate time series from these features. For the current work, this is an ongoing approach. We just think about, we just use the mean. 
And then once you extract the univariate approach, then you have, then you, you divide that data set into two parts, training test sectors. And then we use a deep learning approach to, for the, to, in order to forecast the values. And for the training set, we build an LSTM model and we got the residual series and apply EVT, extreme value theory, to calculate an anomalous threshold. And then after that, we took our uh, forecast errors and apply the anomalous threshold, data-driven anomalous threshold, and I go for this binary classification. We've classified them as typical low outliers. So basically, for this anomalous threshold calculation, we use extreme value theory. This is the theorem that we use, fischer tipper theorem. This is basically, um, uh, so I think if I just summarize the concept here, now, when if I think you all are familiar with the central limit theorem. So in central limit theorem, our focus is on the central part of a distribution. Now, the, if you extend that, now we, the difference between these two is now when it comes to fischer tipper theorem, now we talk about the distribution of the extreme values. And that's what we used uh, in order to identify the data-driven anomalous threshold. So basically what we did was, so we took um, um, a typical a, ta, um, a, a part of the series that covers only the typical behavior. That means our images. Now, now each point represent correspond to one image. Now we took a, a series of images that are free from outliers. And then we build a forecast model and we took the residual. So up to this, you get the residuals. And then we define an anomalous threshold for that using that residuals. And then we come to the test phase. Then we think about the test error, forecast error. And then when, whenever the value forecast errors exceed that point, we call it as an outlier. So that's how we do did that one. So this is how we extra how we um, calculate the data driven anomalous threshold. Basically, we used the Fisher Tipper theorem to calculate the anomalous threshold. And using that here, this is the this is how we define the anomalous threshold. Okay, so that's how we use the same concepts to identify a different type of time series, image time series. So now why we discuss three different things, um, anomaly detection in high dimensional data, anomaly detection in temporal data, and also anomaly detection in image time series. So what next? Now here, um, during these algorithms, we selected uh, some features, uh, the time series features and free image based features, image features, mainly focusing on the applications, data sets that we got from our collaborators. So in the future, we, this, we hope to explore more on feature extraction and feature selection methods to create a better, better feature space suitable for streaming data context. Um, and we also, for the dimension reduction, uh, we used uh, in the current implementation, we use uh, principal component analysis. Uh, we hope to use, we plan to use some other dimension reduction techniques such as multidimensional scaling analysis, random projection to see the effect on the performance of the proposed framework. And we hope to now for our odd stream algorithm, it's a density based algorithm. For the density calculation, we use kernel density estimation method. We hope to do some more experiment on density estimation tests, other density, density estimation methods to get a better TL estimation, and thereby to see whether we can improve the performance of our algorithms. And also, uh, we actually have an explainable AI component in our last project, anomaly detection in image time series. We hope to implement a suitable explainable model for the anomaly detection in image streams because, you know, when we use deep learning approaches, it's a black box optimization method. Once you extract features, those features are not well, this, you, you cannot explain the intuition behind those features is a little bit low. So we try to address that problem through an explain, but by attaching an explainable model to our current work. And also we hope to extend these algorithms to multidimensional multivariate data streams. So these are our future plans with that. Um, so that's basically uh, the end of my uh, talk. And all these slides are available um, on my uh, website. If you go to pretal.netlify app, Netlify the app, and if we under talks, you will be able to identify, uh, get access to these slides. Yes, that's all for my session. Any questions? Um, 
I've got uh, some questions. Uh, Priyanka, you also have some questions. Uh, maybe you can read it towards the end. Uh, so the first question I got uh, for my part is, uh, um, Uh, for the example, for the COVID uh, data, have you thought about ways to take spatial location into consideration as well in your method? Um, yeah, for, uh, in my case, uh, uh, I use features extracted from the time series uh, to my X metrics. But if you want, you can add another feature, for example, location as a feature uh, into your model. Uh, then uh, maybe if they, there's a spatial continuity, uh, the, the series that are close by, they, sh uh, they should get the same, uh, they should provide the a be a forecast same the, uh, using the same best forecasting method. So not only just the features computed from the time series, you can add some other features like location of the time series, or the state or uh, or longitude or latitude corresponds to the time series as features as well. So you can incorporate not only the time series as well as the spatial information into the model. Uh, the next question that I've got is um, uh, uh, visualization of many time series data is a, uh, is a challenge. You approach it very well, but the algorithmic approaches approach do not show trend, which is really important for comparative analysis. Those bubbles you showed don't indicate how, say, for example, price change. Uh, so one thing that you can do is uh, when you project the time series into high dimensional space, you can color the points according to a feature, strength of trend, you can color all of the points. In that way, you can identify the series that have high trend, low trend, something like that. In order to see the dynamic movement of the feature chain, uh, one thing that you can do is as Priyanga used, you can use a moving average uh, moving window and based on the moving window, you can compute some features and next moving window, you can compute some feature. Uh, then you can actually get time series based feature collection uh, uh, the PCA uh, space or time series based feature domain. For this particular period, this is the feature based representation. For this particular period, this is the feature based representation. And you can have some dynamic to see how these things changes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I got a question from uh, Miss uh, Finn. So yeah, I think that is um, uh, I think related, that to is related to fifth slide number 51, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I think that I can use this one, maybe. Yeah. So the question is um, um, uh, regarding these 600 data points, are you, are you referring to the 600 time series? So basically now here the idea is this. So now I have in, this is my large collection, consider this as the large collection of time series. So I have 600 time series here. Here I have the time series ID and here I have the time. And then what I do is I extract features from each of these time series. So if you can remember, this is this was, so here I have 600 time series. Now I extract 14 features from each of these time series. And these are the 14 features that I extracted. And here you can see, now here I have 600 time series and here again, you can see 600 times. So these are the features that I have obtained for the first time series. And if you come to somewhere around 450, that's where I have some anomalous points. And these are the values that I have got. These are the feature values that I have got for this anomalous time series. So now I have 14 features. So imagine these as a columns. If these are columns, these are observations. Now each row represent one time series. Now I have represented that one here in this representation. What I have done is I have represented that high dimensional data space. So here you can see different as, uh, uh, different axes. So those are the dimensions. I have 14 features, so I have 14 dimensions here. 
And what you can see here is just a random projection of my high dimensional space so that I can clearly show you that what I have got is a high dimensional data set. And here I have 600 time series. So since each of these point now represent a data point in my high dimensional space, now that what each point correspond to a time series in my original collection. So here, if you think about one point that represent one time series in this collection. So that's how I identify. And another, I can use another example. Now in this one here, I have, this is just a toy example. I have uh, uh, three anomalous time series. And now I have 600 points. So here, this is the high dimensional space. Now I have 600 points, 600 time series. Each point represents a single time series in this collection. And now here I have marks three outline points with in, in red color that correspond to these time series. I hope it is clear to you. Okay, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Priyanka and Dr. Priyanka, for accepting our invitation to be instructors for today's session. I guess, and I believe it is a very informative and interesting session. So all the participants can get access to the video recording and the materials by the end of the day. And also, if you want to uh, reach out uh, Dr. Priyanka and Priyanka, uh, we will share the information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harsha, for having us and giving us an opportunity to share our work. Thank you for organizing this one and looking forward to the future workshops as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Harsha, and all the organizations, uh, all the organizers for inviting us. Um, yeah, looking forward to the future sessions. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye.